Amen. Say, I have hope. I have hope. I have hope. I have hope. All right. Then say, you are my hope. You are my hope. You are my hope. You are my hope. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Well, this morning we have Pastor Tim Holmes with us. He taught A.G. Kojic before I did. He is the senior pastor of um, Central Assembly here in El Sobrante. He is also the presbyter of the East Bay um, section here. So stand with me and let's welcome Pastor Tim. Turn to someone and say, God is hope. God is hope. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is hope? Or do you just say it? You know what I'm saying? Did everybody get a chance to get one of these cards here as you're walked in? Okay, we're going to pass those out. About eight people help this guy out. Okay, that's going to take too long that way. All right, so a few people help him out. Would you just jump up and just say, I'll take a few of those and pass out? What I want you to do on this card is I want you to write out what, what's the most difficult thing that you have ever faced where you needed hope? What's the most difficult thing that you've ever faced where you needed hope? And I want you to write that in like a quick sentence or a word or whatever, just a really quick thing. And then as soon as that's done, um, we're going to just collect them and then someone just bring them up in a stack to me and I'll deal with those later in the service. But if you'll do that right now, what's the most difficult thing that you have ever faced when you needed hope? All right, write that down right there and we're going to get all started here. You know, I was a, a youth pastor for 19 years, uh, tell, so I'm like 22 right now, so it was pretty cool being two years old and starting out in youth ministry. And uh, anyhow, uh, I was I did that for a long time and uh, especially in Oregon when I was up there we had a, a fantastic time with the youth group that uh, grew to about 150 kids and we had a uh, whenever we went anywhere we would literally take over the place uh, one time we were on a mission trip coming back we went to a Wendy's and this girl Rowan was uh, actually born in Jordan but she was uh, uh, redheaded and kind of had a round face like Wendy's, the person, you know, the actual Wendy's. And so we weren't, the, the service seemed a little slow, but we were coming in with 150 kids. And one of our uh, football guys, uh, he was uh, one of the linebackers for the Forest Grove football team, uh, which you probably never heard of because Forest Grove never won anything. But uh, anyhow, so uh, Rowan put her ha hair back in a uh, these pigtails like, like, uh, Wendy Wood and these two guys, these two big football guys, six foot something, walked around with her and they went up to the manager and said, uh, we're here touring all the Wendy's restaurants and this is Wendy and we're here evaluating and it seems like your service is a little bit slow today. And so she began to apologize all over the place and finally the manager came up to me and said, you know, sir, we're really sorry. Uh, we understand that you're in charge of... Uh, this uh, expedition with Wendy, and uh, you know we're we're gonna we're trying to uh, do the best we can. And if you need us to call in some extra people, we'd be glad to do that. And I said, "What are you talking about?" And they said, "Wendy, she's right over there." And I look, and there's Rowan and uh, you know Doug and all these guys. So it, it's crazy to do things, and, and we learned a lot as youth pastors to just have a lot of fun. And so I want to start out for the next couple of minutes here um, and ask a couple of questions. All right. And uh, these are called would you rather questions, stuff that I would, you know, throw out there on a van ride or whatever. And uh, so here's some questions and just shout out your answer, okay, when you know them. Are you ready? Yeah. Wow. It is early in the morning on a Thursday. Are you really ready? Yeah. Okay, that's much better. Let's do it. Would you rather have a stomach, stomach, a stomach ache or a headache? these pretty quick, all right? Would you rather give a speech in front of 10,000 people or be arrested on national television? Yeah. 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 Right, here's another one. 
Would you rather be able to fly or run faster than sound? Would you rather walk under a ladder or step on a crack? Step on a crack! Yeah, there's always a choice there. Would you rather sleep on a flannel sheet or a satin sheet? Satin. Would you rather play a sport or be a spectator? And I'm just going to end with this one. Would you rather... you got to think about this. Would you rather get poked in the eye with a sharp stick or have your hand nibbled on by a cannibal? Okay, okay, okay. Wait, how many, how many cannibal people were there out there, just by the way? Wow. And the poked out stick, eye with a stick? I mean, you see, the deal is, in life, there's always, always, always a choice, right? There's always a decision to make. And your decisions can be guided by a lot of things. You know, you can be guided by your feelings, like, ooh, none of those are good choices. Or can be guided by your fears, if you're afraid of something, or you think there's going to be a reward for something. You're always guided with that kind of stuff. Or, uh, you know, it's just kind of, there's always a choice, though, that you have to make. And when it comes to a life of hope, a life of a decision to make, you can choose by your feelings, or you can choose by your fears, or you can choose to make your decision by the firm Word of God. The Word of God can actually help you to make a better decision, whether you're fearful or whether you have a strong feeling one way or another, you can actually make a better level-headed decision when you're actually going into the Word of God. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is actually, uh, and I appreciate Sh Sister Sharon sharing uh, the word hope, just bringing up that word. Well, it's a great word. We use it all the time when it comes to our belief in God. But we're going to speak about God is hope, and we're going to look at um, this area of hope. And I'm going to lead you through uh, a story that's in the Bible. And if you can just go to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 27 and kind of put your finger there. And as soon as uh, uh, someone, maybe if you could collect those cards and get them up here to me, that would be awesome as well. Uh, so someone just kind of assign yourself to that and bring uh, all those cards up here. We're going to deal with them at the end, but I don't want to be distracted by them later. All right, First Samuel 27. But before we go there and while you're turning there, I want to begin with this verse in Romans chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. And the Bible says, I'm going to read the New Living Translation. It says, rejoice in our confident hope. In other words, we're supposed to be happy about the hope that we have. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, this brother shared a need of his this morning. Uh, when, our, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them and always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them and be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep and live in harmony with each other. And don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. All right. So all those things are what it says here in Romans chapter 12. Amen. Now, it says live in harmony. Don't be too proud to enjoy and don't think that you know it all. That's what the Bible actually says. I want to talk to you about a guy in the Bible who we all know and admire, and he's David. Like David was a guy that was after God's own heart, and David was a guy that, it was interesting because one of the first interactions that David had with anything God was that this guy showed up at his dad's house, right? And so he showed up at his dad's house, and he said, I'm going to anoint one of your sons as the brand new king of Israel, the next king of Israel. Well, they already had a king. They had Saul, and Saul was the king of Israel, and uh, somehow Samuel knew because he was a prophet of God that that was going to change. It was all changing, and he went out to anoint the next king. And so he goes to the, uh, David's dad's house, to all of his house, and he said, bring me, someone, bring me your son. And so he began to bring one son after another. And Samuel the prophet said, it's not going to be him. It's not going to be him. It's not going to be him. And finally, at the end of it all, 
um, he asked uh, David's dad, you know, do you have anyone else? And he said, well, I have the youngest son is kind of out there working the sheep in the field. And they said, we're not even going to sit down until you bring that guy to us. When they brought David to Samuel, a prophet, David freaked out because all of a sudden he was anointed as the next king of Israel. And they actually anointed him right on the spot by pouring what they call the horn of oil. They poured this oil right over his head so it went on his head, dripped down all over him. It was a ceremonial act by a prophet of God. And this guy was, you know, very young at the time. Now that has got to make an impact on your life. That has got to say in your life, something is going to be special about my life. Maybe you, when you were younger, had someone come and lay their hands on you and pray and, and God maybe has called you into a ministry and, and when you were very young and your mom remembers that day and you don't even remember it. Or maybe, you know, after you became a believer, after you became a Christ follower, you said in some service, I'm going to step up and answer to God's call in your life. We all go through those times when we know that we know that we know that God is in all of this. We know that God is in the middle of all of this. And David was just like that on the day that he was anointed with oil. You know, he was out there one day and the Bible tells that he had these things where he would uh, basically go out there and be a, the sheep would be attacked or he would be attacked or somehow in the camp there would be lions and bears. And he would actually go out there and he would kill the lion and the bear and with his bare hands sometimes or with, uh, I'm sure, a bow and arrow or whatever he used at the time. And he would go out there and he would kill a bear or a lion. So he already knew he could do some amazing things that normal people kind of would be afraid to do. He was a mighty warrior, a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. You know, David also came this one day where he was still young and his dad said, you know, go down there because, you know, our uh, family is in battle. And of course, you know, the story of David and Goliath, everybody was afraid to face this giant Goliath who would come out every single day and he would walk up and say, basically threaten and say, send out one person. If, if uh, I win, you guys serve us. If you win, you know, you're going to, uh, we'll serve you. And uh, that all happened over and over. And David saw all this and said, what are you guys even standing around for? Our God is greater than anyone that would ever stand around threatening or shout at us. That's crazy. Are you crazy? We have God on our side. And with God on our side, who could ever be against us? Who could ever come against the mighty hand of God Almighty? I mean, I killed a lion. I killed a bear. I wasn't ever able to do any of that myself. But I know that I know that I know that God is able. And eventually, he taught the king, King Saul, the guy he was going to take the place of, into killing the giant Goliath. He went out there and he uh, got yelled at by the giant. Everyone said, are you crazy? You know, you're not going to be able to do this. He went out there and he ended up killing the giant Goliath. Anointed by the prophet, killed lions and bears, killed Goliath. And then David was invited to live with King Saul. Saul said, this is a good guy. I like him. He plays the harp. He calms me down. I have a temper problem. I have an anger problem. But whenever David comes in, whenever I get mad, I just want him to sit with me and play his harp so I can just kind of breathe again. And he started hearing some songs that people were making up in the street, though. I mean, they were over there and they were starting to sing Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his ten thousands. And he began to hear this in the streets. He'd hear these children gathering around, you know, like ring around the rosy, but they would be singing in, in these circles and going, Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his ten thousands. And it became, obviously, you know, the Bible story it became very, very angry at David often. And he would think about it and give him these fits of rage and throw spears at David until finally David knew that he had to get out of there. I mean, it was all bad. He knew he had to get out of there. He was called and he honored and he was honored by God. But yet he knew that he hadn't arrived yet. He knew that he wasn't king. He wasn't there. And one of the things about God is God can call you, but then take you through a very, very difficult time. 
How many of you know that when you're called, it feels really good? When you're at the altar time, it feels really good. When you're being refreshed by the Lord, you're being strengthened. It feels fantastic. But yet, in every single life, there will come adversity. There will come trial. There will become $220 in debt. You know, there'll become all these things that come after you that are just there. And they feel like they're pressing upon you in a way that you can't figure out how to get out of it. And that was exactly where David was. He remembered the oil on the head. He remembered the lion and the bear. He remembers Goliath. He remembers playing for the king that he's going to replace. I'm sure he's walking around the palace looking around saying, that's going to be my bedroom. This is going to be my servants. I'm going to keep that guy. That guy, I don't like him too much. I'm going to get rid of him, but I'm going to build my kingdom. I can figure it out. But then all of a sudden, a spear would fly over his head, just barely miss him. Finally, he had to do something about it. He had to leave. He had to go somewhere because it was all falling apart. Refinement is kind of like that. And you see, you have to go through the fire in order to be refined. And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter where you are in life. The minute you walk away from a Holy Ghost altar moment... You are now a target marked by Satan. You are. The devil would like to have you stop everything that God has called you to do. The end of the school year, I know you got all the tests going on, right? You got all the pressure of ending it well and, and doing the right thing. And you may have pressure of what are you going to do this summer? Are you going to have the pressure of, you know, I'm graduating. What am I going to do after this? What is, going to, what is it going to really look like? I'm in this, you know, kind of really cool, awesome place where my life is getting revitalized. It doesn't matter how... How it is right now in a way. It, of course it does. It's all important. But what really matters is that your heart is a heart after God. Not just that you're emotionally caught up in something. The emotions go right along with worship. You know, David danced. He had emotion. All, all over the place. You see, you know, when you have music and when you have expression of worship, you're going to see emotion. You're going to see this great outpouring of God in you. You know, you may speak in tongues. You may uh, just express your worship to God in a great and exuberant way. But when you walk out of here, now you're the target. And God may just take you through a place of refining so that you can do something even greater. You see, that's kind of how it works. And so it all falls apart. And we go here to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 27. He had all his life. He had his promises. But now all of his following disappears. He ends up with 600 people that were loyal to him. He didn't have his 10,000s. He had his 600. They call him David's mighty men. And they went around with him. And when he was out there, he found, they found themselves hiding. They found themselves alone. Wandering from city to city. They now had no fame. They had no money. They had no riches. They were homeless. And they had no hope. Think about this. A calling of God. One day God is going to make me king of Israel. But yet now you're running. You don't know how it's ever going to happen. You're not going to touch the king. You're not going to go in there and kill and make a coup. Because that's not who God called you to be. He would never touch Saul in that way. He would never make it happen. He said, I'm going to allow God to make it happen. And God said, you know what, David? You're not actually ready yet. David would think, I am ready. Remember Goliath, the lions, the harp, all of that stuff? I'm ready. I know all about the palace. I'm ready. And God said, no, you're not. You are not ready yet. He loved God. But where was God? You ever felt that way? I love God with all my heart, but God, I just want you to show up right now. I just want to see you right now. I'm going through the storm. I'm going through the refining fire. God, I'm tired of the fire. It's too hot. It's too much. I can't do it. I can't end this school year yet. Uh, well, I think I'm just going to stop and do something else. I'm going to go back and work at Subway. I'm going to go do something else. You know, I'm going to figure it all out. Amen. Stop it. You're being refined. That's all. Amen. You're being refined. Hold on. There is hope. 1 Samuel 27. Verse 1 says, but David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best I can do is to escape into the land of the Philistines. And then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel and I'll slip out of his hand. 
And so David and the 600 men left him and went over to Achish and Moak, king of Gath. Verse 6 says, so on that day, Achish gave him Ziklag. Basically, David said, you know, would you just give me one of your small, I don't want to live in these big areas. Give me a small town. Give me somewhere that I can take my 600 guys and we can just live there. And what we'll do in exchange is when you have a battle to fight, we'll go out there and we'll fight this battle. So he began to fight the battles for this foreign king, began to just kind of sustain his life in that way. And he ends up in this town called Ziklag. So Achish gave Ziklag, and it has belonged to the king of Judah ever since. David lived in the Philistine territory for a year and four months. He was in Ziklag for a year and four months. A year and four months. Seems like a long time when you're going through a fire. And it's not your town. A year and four months seems like a long time when you're trying to deal with everything in life. Trying to figure out what you're going to do next. Trying to become the king that God called you to be. Trying to do what God exactly called you to be. How are you going to do it? Where are you going to go? But God, I'm in Ziklag. I mean, I'm in the middle of no, I can't even believe this, that this is happening to me. Goliath, bear, lion, harp, all that stuff was so good. It was so, ten thousands, David's got his ten, I can't figure it out. He's in Ziklag. He's in Ziklag, he's in a place that is a territory that he never thought he would be. It's interesting when we begin to read on to, let's just skip over to chapter 30 here real quick. It says, David and his men, actually, let me back up just for a second. So, so what happened is that David was fighting and the king finally said, um, I want you, I'm going to win a really big battle and I'm going to send you, David, and all of your men to join with my men and all together we're going to do this military coup. And so they did that. They went out. But all those other people of the king said, wait a minute. These people don't belong to us. Get them out of here. We can do this on our own. You know, what's to keep them from just turning and killing all of us? And then now they've taken over everything. And so the king said, all right, go back to Ziklag. And the thing is, they came back to Ziklag three days later. And it says here, on that day in um, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 1 of chapter 30, it says, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day, and now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. And they attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. And David and his men, as they reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Have you ever been to that place where you felt like you've lost all of hope? Have you ever, has anyone ever cried yourself to sleep because you've lost, you felt like you've lost hope? Has anyone ever gone through the trial where it feels like everything is not working out? It's not happening. And even David is like, I'm in Ziklag. And he goes and he, he's doing all this stuff just to sustain it. Knowing that he's supposed to be king and remembering the anointed day that it's going to come. I have to have hope. I have to have hope. I can just hang in Ziklag. And then when he goes back there, everything is destroyed. God's not done with him yet. He's being refined. He's in Ziklag. He's being refined by the fire. A year and four months goes back. Everything goes bad. You know, I've, I've been through some Ziklags in my life. When I, was in, uh, when I was 15 years old, my mom and dad divorced each other. And they ended up marrying each other a year later. But then when I was 30, they divorced again for good. And one of the driving things that was part of the divorce factor was something we didn't know about until I was 15. And then it began to occur again. And that's that my mom had a very difficult time with her self-esteem to the point where she would buy bottles full of sleeping pills and take them and try to kill herself. And so she would go through, I remember when I was a tiny kid that they carried my mom out of the church and put her in the back seat of my car and they just kept us kids aside. I remember one time that we were in my aunt's house and they were trying to uh, 
unhook one of those little hooks that go to the bedroom of my aunt. And they were trying to get it open and trying to go outside to the window and keeping us kids aside. My mom had done it again where she was just basically completely out, you know, uh, with all these sleeping pills. And she would have these fits of depression and, and it was just crazy, crazy hard. When I was 30, when they divorced again, I thought, you know, maybe they're going to get married again because I know they still love each other. But my mom just goes through all these things over and over and over. But I remember my mom got really bad after that for a while. She went to this place in Corpus Christi, Texas, where we lived, and she went to a place called Coal Park. And she had taken a lot of sleeping pills, and she walked out of the park, staggered around, and collapsed on the lawn at Coal Park. I remember this like yesterday. Someone in the park found her, called 911, ambulance rushed her to the hospital. They called me. I came straight over there and I walked in on her when they were putting, what they do is they put charcoal in your stomach basically to, and then they make you throw it out, they, they pump your stomach. They were right in the middle of that and I walked in to the middle of that. So I had known she had gone through these things but I would never seen that. My mom didn't recognize me. She didn't know me. She was completely out of it and she checked herself in uh, to have psychiatric and medical treatment. So we would visit her. I visited her most every day. I couldn't visit her for the first week because they try to figure everything out and then they start bringing family in. And I visited her every day. And it was one of the lowest moments of my life because every time that she would get out of that situation and my phone rang, I thought it was my mom again. Every time that my phone rang in the middle of the night, I would wake up and I would answer my phone and I would say, and it wasn't her, I'd be kind of, and I wouldn't say anything, but I breathed a little sigh of relief. I can tell you right now that my mom is serving the Lord. Everything is great in her life. Amen. She loves the Lord. But I can tell you that that's the end of the testimony. But you know what? Ziklag is hard. When you're going through that year or four months or that whatever period of time that God takes you through, it's really hard. And the Bible says in Samuel 30, verse 6, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. How low can it get that even your 600 men are saying, you caused all this, David, it's because of you. Now they're threatening to stone him. And it says, each one was bitter in spirit because his sons of his sons and his daughters. But David, the Bible says, found strength in the Lord his God. But don't ever forget that verse. You might want to underline and circle that verse. But David found hope in the Lord his God. He actually found hope. He actually found that he could make it. You know, here, let me give you just a really quick illustration of hope. And then we're going to wrap up and have some uh, uh, prayer time here. The Bible says, I mean, the Bible, uh, a hope illustration here is that Vice President George Bush, you know, uh, uh, Bush II's father was president for a while. But before that, under Reagan, he was vice president. And he represented the United States at a funeral of the Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev. And Bush was really moved because there was a silent protest that was carried out by the widow of Brezhnev, the leader of the communist Russia. And she stood motionless by the coffin next to her dead husband. And she waited and she looked around and just before the lid of the coffin was closed, just as the soldiers touched the lid to close the coffin, Brezhnev's wife performed an act of great courage and hope. A gesture that is probably one of the most profound acts of civil disobedience ever in front of a communist government. She reached down and she made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. She hoped that there was another life and that that life was best represented by Jesus who died on a cross. And that the same Jesus might somehow yet have mercy on her husband. She wanted to have hope. And let me tell you, there may be times in your life where you're at your ziklag. There may be times, you may be going through it right now. 
that you're at your ziklag, and, and you have to strengthen yourself in the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 56, 3 and 4, David wrote these words later on in life. But when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? In Psalm 31, 14, David said, But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying, You are my God. My future, my future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. Let your favor shine on your servant in your unfailing love. Rescue me. And in 1 Samuel 20, uh, 1 Samuel 30, verses 17 through 19, let's just kind of look at how we wrap it up here. Verse 17 says, David fought them. He went back and he said, I'm going to get back what Satan has stolen from me. I'm going to go back. I am a mighty warrior, not of this king, but I am a warrior of God. And the same God who helped me when it was the lion and the bear, and the same God that helped me when it was the giant, and the same God that helped me in the king's palace to play the harp and it would calm him down. The same God that anointed me with oil. I am going to go back and everything that someone has stolen from me, we are going to get it back. Amen. And so that's exactly what David did. In verse 17, it says, David fought them from dusk until evening of the next day. And none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. Verse 18 says, David recovered everything, 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 everything that the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else that they had taken. David brought everything back. He brought everything back. In fact, it says that after they went out with that plunder, they, the, the plunder is the stuff you get afterwards. They actually had so much of that plunder left that they began to send it to everybody they knew of that had been there along the way of the journey. And they said, we want to not only take everything that's ours back and we want to rebuild, but we are going to take the abundance and not hoard any of it. But we're going to give it away, give it away, give it away out of God's blessing. We will give back. Some of the hope that people wrote down just this morning, your friends, what's the most difficult thing that you've ever faced that you needed hope? Family salvation. Healing. I needed the most hope when I thought I was a failure. Relationships. Fear, doubt, broken friendships. Moving to California. I needed hope when that happened. I wanted to commit suicide. I needed a savior. When my heart was broken. Financial. I needed the most hope when I left home. When my parents were struggling financially, all the doubt, all the times that everybody needed hope, all of these things, difficult to find hope, when my brothers got locked up, they wouldn't let them out. You may know these stories that I don't know. All of these kind of things, giving up, family, over and over and over, we have lifetimes of hopeless times. When you need hope, when you need hope, God is there for you. When you're at your ziklag, God is there for you. It doesn't matter how easy it has been in the past. It's probably going to get hard. In my life, I'm not done with my ziklags. I wish I was. I wish I could tell you, honestly, that there's a point in life where you arrive. I've had lots of ziklags in my life, and I'm not looking forward to the next one. But I am continuing my hope. In Jesus. I am continuing my hope because I'm going to hang on and I'm going to let God do a new thing in me. You know, I thought about this when I was in worship. You guys get four of these a week, right? Four chapels a week. Um, I think after a while it starts feeling like 
There he goes again, or there they go again. Same message, different face. But the message of hope is what will sustain you after SUM. You got a lot of strength here in this room because as iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens another. But walk out there alone. Find a spouse and begin to start your life again and then have difficulty in that area with maybe in-laws or people that just won't accept Christ or won't accept that you have Christ in your life. You're going to go through a Ziklag and you might be in a Ziklag right now. You're used to responding. I get that. You're used to finding God. I get that. But I'm telling you, allow my message this morning to be permeated, permanently linked in your heart. That you will go through a Ziklag. But God is the God of hope. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. He bought you with the greatest price. God bought you with his very own son, Jesus. God loves you. He sent his word to help you. He allows you to have hope through his word. He gives you direction. He gives you strength. When everything feels hopeless, when it feels chaotic, stop. It's just Ziklag again. Yeah. Stop. It's okay. Not good. It's not fun. But what are you going to learn in the refinement of it? Maybe you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Tim, wow. I need hope right now. These, that was yesterday. But right now, the one I wrote now, that's for right now. If that's you, I just want you to respond. You're used to responding, so I'm just going to ask. Just stand up right where you are. I'm that guy. I'm that girl. I need hope right now. I'm going through something right now. I'm in ziplag, I feel like. Some people know about it. That's cool. There may be someone that doesn't know about it because it's kind of easy to smile and jump and to worship God freely. And God will inhabit your praises, let me tell you. But in the middle of your praises, you could still be a ziklag. You're holding on. Everyone that's standing, we're gonna, the rest of us are going to pray for you. So you that are standing, just come right now. Just walk right up here. There's a bunch of you. God is going to do a new thing. I just want you to call that thing out to God and everyone else in the room. Uh, just spread out really good so people can get to you, okay? So everybody else in the room, uh, you're the ministers this morning. Do not allow this to be a chapel that is wasted. Now you see him coming up here. And what I want you to do is if I want you to ask them what their ziklag is and you can tell them it's unspoken. Okay, I, wanna, I don't, you can either tell them what your ziklag is or you can just say, I'm sorry, it's unspoken. God knows what it is, but sometimes it's easier to just say, to let it out. Just say, you know what? I am dealing with a financial struggle. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I do feel attacked. I feel like people don't like me. I feel like Everyone thinks I got it together, but I don't. I don't know what's going on. I'm in ziklag. I'm wandering around trying to figure out what's next for my life. And so right now, just bang. Everyone just come on out. Get behind someone. Get with someone. Uh, I think we may have more people that started than that were out that they're left. So we'll just pray for one another otherwise. Come out, find someone. One-on-one, one-on-one, one-on-one. And you just begin to pour out your heart. You're going through a ziklag right now. I'm telling you, God gives hope. God gives hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just begin to lift up those knees. Ask what, the, ask what it is. You can say unspoken. And you just begin to pray the Holy Spirit down. You begin to pray for comfort and hope and strength. That God will begin to move in every life. That is represented in this room. God bless you. 